Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. Today is Tuesday, November 13th, 2012, and I'm Darko. This is my website right here, uh, www.ggnonline.com. And I just posted a poll here. Um, I don't keep up on it uh, as much as I should, but uh, the new one is, what issue is important to you right now? And um, I did this kind of like just as a joke almost. <laughs> Uh, surprised to see the results. Uh, the first one is the economy, the second is politics, the third is spirituality, and the fourth is General Petraeus' affair and the Libyan cover-up. So, so far, 37% um, are saying the economy, uh, followed by 25% saying politics, 37% saying spirituality, and 62% saying General Petraeus' affair and the Libyan cover-up. So, this says a lot, I think. Um, all right, the headlines and links will be posted in YouTube's video description on YouTube, DDarko2012 and DDarko2013 on my YouTube channels. If you'd like to help, you can donate uh, via PayPal there. Thank you. Okay, back to what we were just talking about, Golan Heights, Israel, uh, Syria. They're escalating it now with uh, Syria. The British are basically going to have boots on the ground, possibly. No-fly zones imposed by uh, France, U.S., and uh, the UK, they're training the terrorists to be assassins. Uh, you have Qatar, Qatar, uh, basically recognizing this new uh, opposition uh, government, and they're the main ones that are funding them as well, to uh, impose this uh, new Islamic uh, state, a theocracy, basically. And you have Israel's elections coming up, I believe it's in December, and the Zionists, right-wing Zionists, want to, you know, they want to get it, uh, uh, get things cooking here. So uh, they're doing it, and they're doing a good job. And we've had, what, mortar rounds from Syria accidentally hit, probably from the rebels. Um, also tanks, and uh, then Israel retaliating and firing on these Syrian mortar batteries. So this is where we left off. Western propagandists attempt to trigger catastrophic Turkish-Syrian uh, war. So this is a month ago, but this is the main thing right here, and this is a Brookings Institute document, a policy think tank. This is what they drew up, saving Syria, assessing options for regime change. So when you see it in the news about a humanitarian crisis and Assad is killing his own people, just know that this thing was written in March 2012. And that it makes no secret that the humanitarian responsibility to protect or rights to protect R2P is but a pretext for long planned regime change. Now, some of you probably remember this, but I have to go over it because it's important. Brookings, Brookings uh, Institute continues by describing how Turkey's aligning of vast amounts of weapons and troops along its border in coordination with Israeli efforts in the south of Syria could help affect violent regime change in Syria. In addition, this is from it. Israel's intelligence services have strong knowledge, a strong knowledge of Syria, as well as assets within the Syrian government that could be used to subvert the government's power base and press for Assad's removal. Israel could posture forces on or near Golan Heights and, in doing so, might divert regime forces from suppressing the opposition, which is on the east, right? And that's what we were talking about. Fierce fighting on Turkish-Syrian border risk igniting broader conflict from November 13, 2012. This posture may conjure fears in the Assad regime of a multi-front war, particularly if Turkey is willing to do the same on its border and if the Syrian opposition is being fed a steady diet of arms and training, which they are, like I said, they've been caught on video on that. Such a mobilization could perhaps persuade Syria's military leadership to oust Assad in order to preserve itself. And they're trying to, of course, bribe these uh, leaders as well and have them defect. The rebels are trying to recruit other uh, terrorist mercenaries as well. Uh, advocates argue that this additional pressure could tip the balance against Assad inside Syria if other forces were aligned properly. It says clearly a buffer zone is the next step for Western designs aimed at exacting regime change in Syria and would be a move that the Syrian government would, of course, not readily agree to. And it's interesting because it was Turkey that was pushing for the, quote, buffer zone, no-fly zone, and then they backed off just recently, and then just we just covered today. It says that it should be noted that this is not a this policy of seeking a buffer zone is not a Turkish policy that was planned and promoted by corporate financier interests emanating from the United States, the United Kingdom, and France. 
So pretty interesting. And being parroted by unpopular elements within Turkish politics, uh, Erdogan, of course, you have people actually um, on a hunger strike dying right now. And, and yet Turkey just continues forward, uh, trying to do whatever it can to become uh, an EU partner. So it goes on, it says that uh, you can see similar scenarios, what's going on, developing with Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan now playing the role as the early 80s Saddam Hussein, who received substantial support both politically and militarily from the U.S., Britain, and France, but ended in both destruction of Iraq and Saddam's eventual downfall. So as fears fighting on the Turkish-Syrian border risk igniting a broader conflict, NATO claims they're ready to defend Turkey against Syria, that's so funny, right? NATO chief repeatedly makes the same uh, promise even as U.S. rejects direct military action. NATO's secretary general issued another uh, statement on Monday about defending and protecting Turkey, a member state, against Syria if indeed a war were to break out. Turkey can rely on NATO solidarity. We have more places or plans in place to defend and protect Turkey, our ally, if needed, Rasmussen told reporters. But this is largely an empty statement. The same statement was issued in early October following skirmishes and shelling along the Turkey-Syria border. If it were indeed to break out, it's true NATO would mobilize in defense of Turkey, as the charter obligates, but Western powers are desperately trying to avoid such an escalation. I was wondering why the UK all of a sudden at the elections was ramping it up, uh, you know, uh, heading this up. Uh, usually it was France, and now it's the UK. Uh, UK's Cameron. It says uh, Turkey may or may not want an escalation in the standoff with Syria, but there will be no NATO war without U.S. backing. And although the U.S. has been meddling in Syria's conflict by sending aid to the rebel fighters and fueling the violence, many in the U.S. still don't see an outbreak of the war in Syria as workable. Once again, we have this uh, analogy to Iraq. The sectarian nature of the conflict in Syria brings back very fresh memories of the power vacuum and subsequent descent into chaos that broke out in Iraq. Finishing up, it says that measures like a no-fly zone would worsen the situation given Assad's considerable anti-aircraft abilities, uh, which are located in urban areas, putting more civilians at risk if the U.S. were to try to take them out. This is also likely to expand the conflict outside Syria's borders, something even war planners aren't willing to risk. Next up, Syrian officials say opposition to meet in Tehran next week. So they're actually trying to uh, to sit down and try to come to some kind of compromise, Iran that is. Says Iran's deputy foreign minister for Arab and African affairs says Tehran is to host a meeting between Syrian government and opposition groups next week. But like I said, they don't want that. They want to, they want to keep it going. Remember this article from May 28, 2012. U.S. Brooking wants to bleed Syria to death. Middle East memo calls for ending ceasefire and purposely perpetuating violence. That's right. When they had that little ceasefire, that temporary one like a month ago, uh, between the rebels and that, the rebels and the, they were mostly extremists and terrorists. They didn't honor that. They were the first ones to break it. Uh, most of you already know, but if you didn't, the same Brookings Institute actually wrote a paper a uh, while back on what? Iran. Which path to Persia? Options for new American strategy towards Iran, you know, invading them. So, of course, Syria is on that path. You have the Israeli nightmare. Peace in Israel is the establishment's worst nightmare. Israel is an excuse, a mandate, a perpetual casus belli, or a case for war, and both an ideological as well as literal beachhead in the Middle East, created and propped up by the West. In particular, the U.S. and the United Kingdom. It has served as a medium through which Western foreign policy flows in and out of the Arab and, to a greater extent, the Muslim world. It is through a carefully cultivated strategy of tension that this perpetual case for war is maintained. Without the constant perceived fear of Israel, Israel's demise and the moral imperative to prevent it, real or imagine it would be difficult to justify Western involvement in nations that otherwise pose no perceivable threat to America or Europe. A class of civilizations uh, is likewise being created within the West itself to augment this paradigm, but it is yet to come of age and still depends heavily on Israeli-Arab tensions to sustain itself. It says Israel does not bulldoze homes because it thinks it will eventually eliminate its enemies by doing so. To maintain a perpetual strategy of tension to justify the perpetual meddling by neo-colonialists in the Middle East, Israel bulldozes homes specifically to create more enemies, 
to think otherwise would be to falsely assume Israel's current leadership is actually invested in the self-preservation of the nation-state when they are not. The best and most recent example of this was using regional hatred towards Israel to implement the opening phases of the U.S. engineered Arab Spring. It goes on and it says that in reality the protests in Egypt's streets were planned years in advance beginning as early as 2008 in New York City by confabs organized by the U.S. State Department. In essence, the West and Israel played people's emotional persuasions like a fiddle and executed one of the most profound geopolitical reorderings in recent history. The same ploy was used against Libyan leader Gaddafi, who was accused of being Jewish, hiring Israeli mercenaries and using Israeli weapons. This inflicted with him the touch of death incurred by this strategy of tension, which is say they used the same tactics against Syria uh, with Haaretz in an Israeli op-ed titled Israel's favorite Arab dictator of all is Assad. Then we have Gaza factions call for permanent armistice with Israel, but Israeli officials push for war as opposition criticizes the timing right before the elections, like I was saying. The group said they would unify in halting all fire on Israel, and it says they would move against those that violated the rule just so long as Israel ends their attacks and ends the blockade on humanitarian goods to the tiny ship. But some in Hamas downplay the chances of this, saying they aren't really considering another ceasefire right now and are focused primarily on defending against Israeli attacks. As Israeli officials talk up a choice between some escalation or a full-scale invasion with ending their strikes, let alone ending the blockade, not really being taken seriously, it says it's not surprising when Israeli media reports a political split on the question of Gaza war now, just months ahead of the election, the split is between opposition figures who say it is not the right time and members of the cabinet who assist the election is no good reason to get in the way of war. Either way, they're going to do it, right? Reality is that Gaza poses no real threat to Israel. Even before getting the U.S. to pump money into their Iron Dome system, the rockets really hit anything, and if they did, the glorified fireworks in the Gaza arsenal usually did minor damage to someone's roof at worst. It says Israel denies ceasefire and threatens to invade Gaza again. Netanyahu prepares international public opinion for another invasion. Israeli artillery continued to attack the Gaza Strip over the weekend, killing at least five Palestinians, while several groups fired scores of rockets at Israel. You have uh, Perez of Israel to the Jerusalem Post. Idiotic rockets warrant response. The president blasts Gazan terrorism, saying Israel must respond swiftly and strongly to them. So that was the president. Netanyahu to brief 50 foreign ambassadors on possible Gaza operation. The Israeli prime minister is set to meet with 50 foreign uh, ambassadors to brief them on recent violence in the Gaza Strip and rally international support for a possible ground operation in the coastal. So here we go, right? He wants to make sure that the international community will understand the reasons if Israel is forced to act. They have no other choice. They must kill. So besides the five Palestinians that were killed in this uh, Israeli attack, the uh, Israeli Defense Forces gunfire kills a Palestinian boy in Gaza clash. The medics say the boy, age 12, was hit by machine gun fire either from Israeli helicopters or tanks that took part in the incident. 29 kids hospitalized as Israel raids school with tear gas. A total of 29 children had been rushed to a hospital in Israel's southern Negev desert after Israeli police raided a school with tear gas and bullets. The forces from the Interior Ministry, accompanied by police, entered the village to distribute demolition orders for homes, which led to the clashes and stone throwing. Came across this today, a clean break, a new strategy for securing the realm. It says here is commonly known as the Clean Break Report, a policy document that was prepared in 1996 by a study group led by Richard Pearl for Benjamin Netanyahu, which explained the new approach to solving Israel's security problems, i.e. their expansion. <laughs> with an emphasis on Western values. It has since been criticized for advocating an aggressive new policy, including the removal of Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq. So it says it provides the nation room to engage every possible energy on rebuilding Zionism. So one of the three policies is rather than pursuing peace with the entire Arab world, Israel should work with Jordan, uh, Turkey to contain, destabilize these entities that are threats to all three, like Syria says changing the relations with Palestinians, specifically reserving the right of hot pursuit and severing ties with the U.S., getting off the, the uh, umbilical cord, which is what I think they're doing. And some of the criticisms is that they're advocating a use of proxy armies for regime changes. Hmm, sound familiar? 
So we'll return with this in part three. This is GGN. I'm Darko. Thank you.